And Conor Ben's two failed drugs tests in the lead up to his fight, catchweight fight, 157 pounds, a big, big fight, of course, with Chris Eubank Jr. Um, there's been a lot of fallout, there's been a lot of darkness around boxing for the last fortnight. And we're joined now by who I consider to be one of the journalistic animals of, of uh, sports writing. He's a brilliant journalist, uh, Matt Lawton, the Times chief sports correspondent. Good evening, Matt. Hi, Gareth. Hi, Spencer. Good evening, Matt. Um, Matt, you, you are renowned as a, as a Rottweiler with a bone when you've got a very strong story, but you, you've got a magic wand with your words as well. Um, you did an interview with Conor Ben. It was in The Times yesterday. Um, it's one yeah. of those unusual situations where someone has um, adverse findings, they call it, or a positive test in their body, <laughs> and yet they're sitting with you and obviously there's a lot of stuff behind lawyer speak but they're proclaiming their innocence tell us about your sit down with color um with connor ben and how it was yeah yeah look i, I think the way you've just put it is you know it's a really interesting way of putting it and a really uh, uh relevant way of putting it it's when you're sitting in a living room with a 26 year old guy his 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 wife is is in the kitchen. His little boy is knocking around. And Nigel Nigel his dad had actually taken him out, and he is breaking down in tears. He is angry at times. He is appears broken at times. You know, unless you've unless you've got a cold heart, you can't help but feel something for the guy, even if even if he's actually guilty. You know what I mean? Mm. It, it's yeah. I always think it's about dopers, and 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 I'm not saying he is a doper, but because I've done a lot of these sort of stories, as you know, Gareth, you know, you meet a lot of these people, and and actually, drug cheats often get treated like absolute pariahs, mm. and and we do actually have to apply a little bit of perspective to it. Um, you know that they are, yes, they are. You know, the, the, those that are guilty are cheating, and and, and they deserve to be condemned for that but you know they're not they're not murderers um uh that you know they're, they're, they're not committing the most heinous crimes in my opinion so you see a guy who as we know was about to and i think lives fairly modestly at the moment judging by where i went to this week this was a life-changing fight it was going to be the biggest payday of his uh of his career and and would have changed the lives of all his family members so that was you know quite it was quite tough to see a young guy he, he's actually a, a little aside my eldest daughter they were in the same class together in wow. so wow. okay so i remember only briefly in, a, in an infant school down in beckenham uh in southeast london um so i i have no relationship with connor ben i used to actually be quite respectful towards Nigel and never sidled up to him outside the school gate and said, oh, by the way, I'm a journalist. I, <laughs> I completely left him alone. But, uh, you know, I, I, I remember Nigel Ben as a five, year, uh, Connor Ben as a five-year-old. So, but look, there's that. Yeah. And there's that human side of it. And then there's the facts. And the facts are these. He failed two drugs tests for a drug that we know would have an enormous benefit to any kind of athlete in a power sport like boxing. and An inherently did, dangerous sport, remember, and their yes. bodies are being used as their weapons. Yes. And that's, yes. the, that's the key thing, isn't it, you know? Yes. And look, there are, and what I tried to do with the piece is there are points that he made, and part of the problem with all of this at the moment for all of us is, you know, as much as he was able to tell us uh, this week, we don't know everything yet. Mm. So, so you know, Mike Morgan, the anti-doping lawyer that he's he's uh, that he's hired, who's who's one of the best and 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 has and has sort of been involved in some very high-profile doping cases. Um, it would be much easier to make a judgment on this if we knew everything that Mike Morgan knows. However, there were a couple of points that he made that certainly have me scratching my head and wondering if his claim of contamination, ha, you know, is in some ways plausible. The first one is this, is the fact that he, he, he was on the VADA testing programme from February. He knew 
through the course of fighting in April and, and obviously he was due to fight in October, that he was going to get tested a lot. And I think he was probably tested in that period maybe seven times. So why would he why would he cheat? Why because he's he going to take, expose himself. Well, well, yeah. Yeah. Well, no, no, not so not so much cheats, because there's certain drugs you can take that, you know, got a very short uh Body uh, life. identification yeah. window but the point is with clomiphene is it is in the system a long time and the fact up to is 11 that, weeks that, matt were you'd know is it up to yeah, 11 weeks yeah uh, months and months and months yeah and and, the, and 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 that is borne out as we are led to believe by the fact that the july 25th positive was significantly more than september 1st positive right and i believe if you look at they call it a bell curve if you look at the curve, I believe the two results will indicate that there's no more clomiphene gone into his system between those two dates. It just, it's just, it just shows that it's it, it that has there's been less in there all of it in his system by yeah. then. Yeah. But the fact mm. of the matter is, it's been in all that time. Yeah. Now that's yeah. point one. So, so look, Rick Broadbent, my colleague, made a very good point on Twitter because could because the quote that Connie used, "You've got to be an idiot to take this." I'd have to be an idiot to take this drug. And as Rick Broadbent said, there's been lots of idiots that have been caught taking drugs. <laughs> so, 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 so there's that point. But, but it is, a, it is a, for me, a troubling point because it's a really stupid thing to do if that's the, your drug of choice when you know you're going to be tested a lot in that period. It's crazy, crazy, crazy. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the other point is this, is that he, he told us that they have identified a contamination window just before that first test. And the only way, as I understand it, because I, you know, I, I, I walked away and I was like, right. And, I, and there are, you know, I, I do know people, I know anti-doping lawyers and I know, I know scientific people. So I, so I went away from that interview and I made some calls to try and sort of establish what was meant by that. And what that basically means is that in that substance, in that sample that he gave on July the 25th, is the pure clomiphene. It hasn't been totally metabolized by the body. And that would indeed indicate that he'd only just taken it. And if, as they say, it was a minute trace, and they claim not performance enhancing for that reason, yet again, why would you bother? Yet again, contamination does seem plausible however the difficulty i think any of us have with this and the challenge facing mike morgan is to explain okay if it's contamination how the hell did a drug like clomiphene get into his system no, no, and, I, and, and and that's that's the difficulty yeah, here yeah. That, that that's the bit that as much as the tears and the anger yeah. and the and the impassioned defense of himself there's still the science and there's still the evidence at well, the end so, of the day gareth you know the way this you know we have to we it's evidence based that we have it to has to our, sports our science needs to speak well, i mean we, we we on the top of the at the top of the hour matt there's, there, there are, it's a column I wrote this morning in the Telegraph online. It's just, there are at least, and I only wrote half the questions, there's about 20 questions that need answering. The problem we have is, and I've got to ask you this before we go to break as your final answer, um, and, and read the piece, it's fascinating, the interview. Um, the final question I've got for you, and I need an answer to, is you've been around in sport long enough, and this is boxing, Surely, when a positive test came up, regardless of Eddie Hearn's excuses that he could not contractually um, pull the fight, surely you have to pull a fight in that instance, that you don't try and go through with it. Yeah, and the bit that I have the biggest problem with, like we, we were questioning this, weren't we? You know, after the mail broke the story, we were questioning why if they knew at the end of September, why were they still pressing ahead with the fight? Yeah. The fact of the matter is, we now know but they all knew, including the British Bo Boxing Board of Control, that they all actually knew at the end of at the end of August. Yeah. So that, for me, is a car crash for the sport of boxing. Yeah, and it has been. Um, and we're picking uh, up the yeah. pieces, you know. Yeah, and and it doesn't reflect well on anybody um, because it, it, you know, it's it, it, you know, the, the, these are the situations. Now, what I would say quickly, Gareth, though, is that. Sometimes when these cases are ongoing, 
athletes do continue to do what athletes do. Mm. We had a situation. I, I, I was a few years ago. I was in I was in uh, uh, Israel, uh, and Chris Froome was riding in the Giro d'Italia, and and his salbutamol positive uh, or an, uh, adverse analytical finding case still hadn't been resolved. And there were people, there were other riders that he was up against in that Giro d'Italia who were saying he shouldn't be there, he shouldn't be here until this case is resolved. But the fact is, it hadn't been resolved. And the fact is, you know, the but he wasn't argument, punching is, someone in the face, Matt. He wasn't okay, punching okay. someone in the head. Yeah, that's no, the that's difference. A, that, you is, know. that is a very, that, you know, that is a very good. Very it's not point. a football Very tackle. It's not. I mean, rugby. You could make yeah. that case, but when I think when they're contact sports, and yeah. particularly, I'm sitting here with a guy mm. had a brain hemorrhage. Yeah, I'm sitting here with Spencer Olive had a brain hemorrhage. Yeah. You know, yeah. luckily Sergei Devikov, who we fought, didn't test positive. But we mm. are look. I think we're looking at criminal activity. Mm. If someone's got something negative, a positive in their system, that's a known steroid, and they fight, and someone dies in the ring, or they're irreparably damaged. The sport has no moral standing from that point, you know. Sure. Yeah. No, no. There, 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 there was a danger element to it, which, yeah, which, which, it, which, you're absolutely right, is different to other sports. Yeah, boxing is, is the most brutal of sports. 